Um, good evening, everyone. Um, over the summer, Compass was working with other organizations, got over 350 uh, uh, other organizations to back a statement um, that after COVID that we needed to build back better. The statement called for a more secure, caring and equal society um, and measures to deal with the climate emergency. Support came from faith leaders through to the CBI and the TUC. But to build back better, we need to ask the big question, how? That is what we'll be doing over a series of events this week and next week to, with the support and help of the European Cultural Foundation and tonight the Friedrich Ebert Stift Fund. Um, so how do big ideas like a four day week in UBI get put in, into practice? How do we make a rapid transition to carbon neutrality? How do communities and people co-create these solutions and what sort of leadership is required to make all of this happen? Build Back Better is a global call, but ours um, was a UK initiative, but of course, we realize that to make it meaningful, it can't just be about one country. So tonight we start the series by asking the question, globalization, how? In the shadow of Brexit and the looming presidential elections in the States, what is a progressive internationalism and how do we achieve it? To help us answer the questions, we're fortunate to be joined tonight by Lisa Nandy MP for Wigan, apparently, um, who is the shadow foreign secretary. Anthony Barnett, who's the uh, co-founder of Open Democracy and the re recent author of an essay, Out of the Belly of Hell, COVID-19 and the Humanization of Globalization, and Dr. Dina Friedman from the LSE and author of a, a brilliant uh, recent book called Gang Can Globalization Succeed? The format will be that each speaker will get 10 minutes and I may ask them a few questions after their 10 minutes. Then it's over to you in the Zoom room for questions um, to, to the panel and we'll finish at dead on 7.15. Grace will manage the question bit. Please place any questions you've got in the chat box, which you'll find at the bottom of the screen. Please tweet about what you hear and think using the hashtag uh, build back better how. So over to you, Lisa. Globalization, why, how, what are you, what are you thinking now? Oh, well, thank, thanks very much. And I think I've, some of you may have caught me saying this when you were coming into the room, but um, and my five-year-old is about to have a bath next door. So if there's a lot of noise in the background, I apologise in advance. I do sometimes say I'm sure Churchill didn't have to put up with this when he was thinking about great questions of, of globalisation. But I'm really pleased to be with you and to Compass for hosting this tonight. And it's really nice as well to see some old friends on the on the screen in front of us. Um, I think the great turnout tonight is a reflection of how it really does feel like the world is facing a crossroads moment. When I was appointed to this post as Shadow Foreign Secretary in April, I didn't really quite foresee just how quickly so much of the global cooperation would unravel so fast. We've got an increasingly assertive stance from China, one of the world's great superpowers. We've seen the collapse of the nuclear deal in Iran. We've got a Russian government that interferes in British democracy and democracies around the world and increasingly isn't showing respect for the international rules and norms uh, that global cooperation is built on. And we've got a government closer to home who recently have signaled that they're prepared to rip up those rules and norms when it suits creating even more instability in a world that increasingly feels like it's spinning out of control. It feels like the world is becoming more dangerous, less cooperative, less open and less free. Freedom has been in retreat across the world for 14 straight years and under the cover of COVID in many countries, we've seen a crackdown on the rights of freedom of speech of minorities uh, and attacks on refugees and migrants uh, attempt to scapegoat individual individuals and ethnicities for the COVID crisis. Our ability to come together when we most need it is significantly in doubt. And of course, the ability to solve not just COVID, but also the world's most pressing problem of climate change, without which no other problem, frankly, matters. And who seems to care about this? Brexit, Trump, Johnson, people are voting for this. Their vote, it feels that they're voting for a world that is breaking apart, not a world that is coming together. The lesson of the last few years is that the arc of history does not always bend towards progress. Now, why is this happening? Let me give you an example. And I want to start closer to home. 
the one of the the part of the blurb around this seminar was about glo the global and the local and it's something neil and i have been grappling with as well as the guest speakers on tonight's call for quite some time one of the the major things i'm dealing with at the moment is the collapse of my local football club wigan athletic something that matters deeply to people here profoundly a club that has stood at the center of our town for over 100 years people's identities our pride in the community our family histories are deeply bound up with this club but it was plunged into administration earlier this year when the hong kong financiers that had bought it pulled the plug uh, and um, as a consequence something that has served as an anchor for many people in this community is in danger of being whisked away a, a club that matters more than just sport at the whim of financiers on the other side of the world and the institutions that were set up to protect us and the things that matter from those forces just not working at all too often what i've seen is that the club the fans the community are the last thing that features in those institutions rather than it should be the first and when i look at my caseload as the mp for wigan for the last decade whether it's football fraud or flooding it is absolutely clear that whether it's in bolton or bangladesh globalization isn't working for working people and if it isn't working for working people in my view it isn't working at all now in the labor party we love to reach into our history for inspiration as john crudders has said often uh, it's what we do when we're short of ideas and labor for some time has been desperately short of ideas so we talk about a new climate change act or we talk about a return to the ethical foreign policy of robin cook but it's not policy I'm reaching for in the past, but it's an approach, an approach that was built in the era of Ernie Bevin and a generation of post-war leaders that rooted our actions abroad in consent at home and the interests of working class people both at home and overseas. I think the greatest threat to our age now to freedom, to democracy, to human dignity is our inability to collect, connect the global and the local. So I'm really pleased that Neil's agreed to host this series of seminars of which this is the first today to help us rebuild an approach to internationalism and a foreign policy that is fit for the challenges of this century and not the challenges of the last. And as we approach the American elections in a few weeks time, there's no doubt in my mind that this is a momentous moment for the world that will set the tone, the context of what happens next. There is the prospect of a second term Trump administration. There is also the prospect of a Biden administration that in his words recently seeks more openness, more friendships, more cooperation, more alliances, more democracy as an antidote to our times. I was encouraged to read the words that no army on earth can match the way the electric idea of liberty passes freely from person to person, jumps borders, transcends languages and cultures, and supercharges communities of ordinary citizens into activists and organizers and change agents. But whatever the outcome of those elections in a couple of weeks time, the challenges remain and Britain must play a role in building the world we want to see. Those challenges, how to build global insecurity, uh, global solidarity in an age of insecurity, so that we construct a trade system that doesn't pit the interests of working class people in China against the interests of working class people in the United States and threaten the global order and global stability as a result. Keeping people safe, in my view, is the first job of any government. But economic insecurity has not been recognised in our approach to foreign policy as a major cause of global instability. And when people feel insecure, when they feel afraid, when they feel the world is spinning out of control, we lose the ability to understand one another. And that's how you get strongman leaders who help to make this situation worse. So we have to build global institutions that help us to come together, not break us apart. Global institutions and actions that are rooted in consent here and abroad by reaching beyond just the narrow approach of working from state to state with governments 
overseas, but with trade unions and civil society, the factors that produce Trump will still be at play in the United States if a Biden administration wins. And so we've got to take a far more nuanced approach to foreign policy that understands the complexities of the forces that drive great geopolitical events. Um, Mine is a generation that came of age in the era of the Iraq war. I marched against the Iraq war and was very proud to work for an MP who opposed it, even in the face of public support, which is often forgotten, uh, and of great pressure from the leadership of my own party. But it, we also came of age in an era of Sierra Leone, when that life-changing game Save, uh, life-saving, game-changing intervention, ch saved lives. It changed the lives of people overseas and was a source of great pride to many people in Britain. And that's why I say that we learn from our history. We remember our history, but we should never be bound by it, neither afraid to step out and work as a force for good in the world, but neither forgetting that to do so, we have to we have to make sure that those actions are rooted in the consent of the people that we seek to support overseas. A an approach that seeks friends, that takes Britain from being an alliance breaker to an alliance maker. The world that we will inherit is infinitely more complex than the world that I grew up in. The certainties of the Cold War era are over. Our our, uh, our friends in some fights pose great challenges in others. Take China and the appalling persecution of the Uyghur people, but the way in which China has stood up in recent days and offered some hope that the world may come together and reach an agreement on climate change around COP26. These are complex, nuanced, difficult challenges that we face, and to navigate them, we will need friends. Now, I'm encouraged that the Joe Biden administration appears to see the world in this way too, and is seeking to build alliances. We have to reject this narrative that has been built by the Conservative Party that says that we're a small island nation punching above its weight without ever stopping to ask why on earth it is that we're punching at all. I want us to be a country that goes out and sheds light, not might, around the world. The sort of country that flies the pride flag in countries where just loving who you love is a crime often punishable by death in order to give hope to people in parts of the world. As, a, as the former Australian Prime Minister Anthony Shifley once said, so that Labour is the light on the hill for people in times of darkness, and these are very dark times indeed. New times need new values. So to add to the post-war settlement values of human rights, democracy, free speech, the rule of law, I would say that we need to put human security, human dignity, environmentalism and feminism at the heart of our approach too. And I would say that new times require a new sort of leadership. And we're starting to see this developing across the world. The sort of leadership that I've seen from leaders like Jacinda Ardern, who do not believe that compromise is cowardice, that are, that are prepared to be honest with the people that they represent um, and reject the strongman machismo that we've seen so often in the world in recent times. Now, finally, I would just say this, where is the hope? Because I painted a bleak picture of the world as it currently is. And I would say that the hope lies in the fact that people got there before us. They are smarter than we think. And for all of the privileges and the education that Boris Johnson and this government have had, people are smarter than they are. They saw a global system that wasn't working and those great upheavals, those political earthquakes that have happened in Britain and around the world, including in my constituency with the dramatic rise of support for UKIP, the vote to leave the European Union, these were all signs that things were out of joint and that things needed to change. Our challenge is to make sure that we channel that energy into building a world that is different. Now, that will require more democracy at home and it will require more democracy at, abroad. As Attlee once said, socialism is a more exacting creed than its, uh, than its comparators. It requires active, constant participation. In short, we build the world we want to see together. And that is why in the last few months, uh, as I took on this post at this huge moment for the world, we have been making sure that we stand with the people, the young people, those brave protesters in Hong Kong who are standing up for those values, that we stood with the Black Lives Matters protesters in the United States 
and across the world that we stood with the women of Belarus as they stood in front of masked armed men in order to stand up for freedom and democracy so that little by little the world becomes a little bit safer and more secure and hope burns a little bit brighter because of who we are and what we do together. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lisa. I mean, really good suite, full of values. I mean, I think we'll come on a bit with Anthony, then more with Dina about kind of what the institutional and some of the kind of practical things that need to happen. Um, but just back to you, just just one question for me, because you, you've identified Labour's kind of checkered history on internationalism over, you know, in its period of last period of government. I mean, how do we get this to be at the heart of what Labour does and think rather than a kind of outpost foreign affairs? You know, how do we, you know, because the point about talking about the global and the local is to build, hard bake this into everything that the party does and thinks about and sees internationalism as bound up with every other bit of policy and, and, and action. How do we get it into the, the, the kind of DNA of the party's uh, thinking? Well, I guess I feel, I feel, in a strange way, despite all the things I've said about the darkness of the times, I feel tremendously optimistic about this. I think the world is reaching a moment of choice where we either choose to break apart or we choose to pull together. And what I've learned over the last few months is that even in opposition, Labour can be an active participant in that battle. It's why we've stayed in the uh, Party of European Socialists, the progressive grouping across the European Union, because we believe that by building those alliances, keeping those alliances with our close friends and allies in Europe and elsewhere, we can make sure that we turn the ship in the right direction. And, you know, when Keir and I said in the leadership contest that whatever the outcome, I think we knew we knew the outcome from the very beginning, but whatever the outcome, we would be a team. He meant it and I meant it. And that is exactly what we've done over the last few months. And one of the reasons I was so heartened to get this job is because it signifies that foreign policy is not an outpost. Uh, it's not an addition to what Labour does at home. The, the values that we project out in the world are based on the values that we hold as a country and the sort of country that he will lead, the sort of country that we will seek to build with others, with other progressives across the political spectrum out into the world um, post 2024 will be based on the same values. Um, and that is, you know, that is why there is an awful lot of thinking going on across the Labour movement at the moment about how we build that party, what sort of that country, what sort of country we want to be, who we are, what matters to us. Um, but how we then go out into the world and make that a reality, um, that is an approach that I feel really passionately about. And I think it chimes very much with the approach that Compass has always taken, which, you know, to sort of paraphrase praise Caroline Lucas, that we all have something uh, to contribute and something to learn and that nobody has the monopoly on wisdom. And that's the approach that I want to take into foreign policy. And I guess that's why, you know, with so many friends on this call and elsewhere, that's why I feel optimistic about what is to come. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. In terms of optimism, it's good to then turn to Anthony Barnett, who's written one of the most optimistic pieces about the, the globalisation moment and the turning point that we may be at. So over to you, Anthony. Um, well, well, thank you very much, Neil, and thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a great privilege to be on this, um, this discussion, and especially with the uh, Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary, Lisa. She's just made a very sort of formidable statement of what she's thinking and how Labour is thinking. And I want to come back at the end. I want to just make three points, but the, um, the final one is about what relationship those of us who are, you know, want a better world and especially in terms of climate change how we can relate to what Labour Party is doing in his thinking and the first thing I want to say was it's a story that comes via Stuart Wood uh, who was Gordon Brown's um, foreign foreign affairs assistant and he told this time that there was the time when Gordon went to China I think he may have just been prime minister or was just about to become prime minister and he was taken aside by a very senior Chinese official. So in a private sort of off the record moment, and the Chinese official said to him, asked him, are you for Europe or are you for the United States? And Gordon said, well, we're for both. We, we build a bridge between them, we're for both. 
and we don't see any fundamental difference. And the China just shook his head. And he said, you, you have to make a call. And I think this is the traditional politics, uh, that that is right, that, that a country like ours does have to make that call. Um, and the, we all want Trump to be thrashed at the polls, which is a possibility. And we all are looking forward to having a Biden presidency, as Lisa just said. But we have to think that when Lisa becomes foreign secretary in four years time, there will be another American election. And if Trump loses, the Republican leadership, the head of the Republican Party is likely to be a young white woman, focus group made to go down well in the suburbs, which it appears that Trump is, is losing. And at the moment, despite everything he's done, over 40% of American voters support Trump. He's just remade the Republican Party. So the likelihood is, if certainly if Biden, aged 82 or 83, is running to become president again, that uh, as Lisa becomes foreign secretary, it will be in the face of a renewed Trumpite United States, deregulating as against a European system, which is for a European a regulated world. And it's not a matter of reversing Brexit, I might come to that, but uh, uh, there is a, a profound choice of where we belong, where we go as a world, and that includes all of the other different nations, not just England, uh, of where we're heading. Are we for Europe or are we for the United States? And the second thing I want to say, which echoes quite a lot of what um, Lisa has been saying, is that the younger generation, what you might say the generation of Black Lives Matter, which was the Occupy generation, perhaps uh, uh, 30 or under 35, want politics to be done in a new way. So I greatly, I think it's terrific, Labour saying, look, we're going to stand with Hong Kong, we're going, the people of Hong Kong, we're going to stand with the women in Belarus, not just the women in Belarus. Um, but we want politics to be done in, in a new fashion. And that, with the environment as a crucial issue, is quite a difficult thing to achieve. It's not obvious how we do that, how we reach out to that, how we become part of that. And so that brings me to the third thing, which is how what, what is particularly valuable about this discussion is it's a discussion by those of us who've been have the privilege to write or publish about affairs. With, with somebody who hopefully in a very short period of time will be responsible for making foreign policy. And so the question is, how can labor in this particular case open itself up to that discussion and those arguments? And here, let me, let me try and put it this way because my memory goes back uh, uh, to Wilson. We have in terms of administrative ability, perhaps the most skillful labor leader I've ever known. So you can look at uh, Wilson, look at Callahan, or look at Kinnock, or look at uh, Ed Miliband, or in his own different way, Corbyn. All of them were, were sought to manage the Labour Party and the complications and difficulties in it. And two leaders, John Smith and then Blair and Brown, sought to give it a, a, a new kind of project a new direction. And in doing so, we're quite confident enough to reach out to others who are outside the party in a very deliberate fashion. So John Smith, who's on the right of the party, invited us, who I was running Charter 88, to open up the discussion about how human rights and reform in, in a completely new political context for him. And in their own way, Blair and Brown although they were right, rightly controlling, they sought the energy, the ideas, and they sought to build that in. So I'm very pleased that Lisa quotes Caroline Lucas, but at the moment, I don't get a sense of uh, Labour purposefully looking for bringing that energy in. And if I would put it this way, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, well, we should have discussions about what will the shape of European and American relations look like over the next 20 years. Right, which we, we should. It's how can, it's the feeling if you enter into that discussion with the Labour Party, with the Labour leadership, that they want to make a call. 
that they know these are going to be hard decisions and that they're driving to say, this is how we're going to do it and explain that to the larger public. And I think the public, and here this is a point which Lisa has always made, the public sense, they may not go for the detail, but the question of what kind of country we want to be, where are we going? They understand that, they, they can feel that, that and, 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 and they can feel if you're dithering or if you're trying to muddle and, and, and get around it, and they, they know the difference. So these big questions, and I think in the short run, the American European one is a very big, big question, that they're going to be faced up to. It doesn't mean you could say we're for Europe or we're for the United States. It's not, it's not a simple matter, but it, there's, it's a, there is a profound strategic choice and a process of being serious and determined to make that choice and make that call and explain it. Um, and overshadowing this, this is the last thing I would say, is the problem for us here of Brexit. And the problem is that Brexit answers these questions by saying, we're global Britain, we're Great Britain, we're, you know, Gove is, we're for a free country and that's it, that's our solution. And the problem is that Brexit is a breakdown. It's not a policy, it's a system breakdown. Of course, I've written a book about how much it drew upon democratic support of it, what, what I called England without London. So it has deep roots, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but nonetheless, it isn't going to work. Brexit is a system failure. And so you have to try to answer these questions and at the same time show the willingness to say, we're going to have to face up to this failure and we're going to have to address this in terms of the voters and we're going to have to explain our way out of this failure. So our relationship in the United Kingdom to globalization has been buster, you know, we're going to just be global, but actually not take any notice about issues of how do we share sovereignty, what are the new natures of, of political movements, which are being denounced as woke, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that isn't going to last. It just isn't going to work. And people can feel the failure now. They can feel that the government is sort of trapped by the toxic nature of this deep and profound running away from reality. And it can't be answered by extremely good administrative alternative. Obviously, if, if Keir Starmer and Liesl are running the country now, instead of the shower that we've got in place, it would be much better run. But that isn't the choice that's going to be in front of us. So as we move into these big issues, we're going to have to take very big calls. It's not just a matter of how we see the world working, but and how will Labour bring in the energy and the arguments of others if it's going to answer them properly. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, uh, so I can, I, again, it's the same point, really, you know, the, the, the one I was making to Lisa. How do we, you know, how do we bake, this needs to be baked into, it can't be an adjunct. Um, you know, what do we say to Labour to get them to think systematically and coherently? So that internationalism, in its, not just in its kind of, uh, um, you know, money for the developing South, but into a strategic response um, about climate, about the bond market, um, about taxation, and we'll come on to some of this stuff with, with, with Dina. It's got to be baked in, and, and Labour's never baked it into its thinking, has it, internationalism, in that strategic sense? Baked in, I'm not sure baked in is the, uh, the, the right word to use. Um, it, 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 the, the, the problem is, uh, uh, which, which I feel, and uh, I, that's why I'm, I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation, is that a sense of labor needs to be listening, a thinking and deciding. So there needs to be a process whereby it's not simply saying, we are going to discuss these issues internally, come to our view and then demand party discipline and then people will vote for it. Actually, that is a loop that is, policy is not going to be like that anymore. So this is quite a testing and open process. Okay, um, uh, well, let's hope that that, you know, that it does become open and, and testing. And the great thing that you've done is open up 
the kind of Pandora's box of the optimism of globalization and the kind of the, the interconnectedness because of technology and because of the issues. And I think this is a, you know, this is a potentially pivotal moment um, uh, if we get the politics of it right and we get the institutions and structures of it right. And somebody who's been thinking about that and writing about that um, uh, really well um, uh, is Dina Freeman from the LSE. So given what you've heard, Dina, you know, how do we begin to build some of the architecture and ideas that kind of put this kind of moment you know, into a reality which builds the kind of progressive internationalism that we want? Okay, thank you very much, Neil. And um, hi, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here, part of this really um, fascinating conversation. Um, I think what I want to do is try and actually start from somewhere different and, and really approach this in a slightly different way, just to sort of, in this time of chaos that we're in, sometimes throwing things open and letting things settle in a different way can be a productive thing to do. So much of the discussion is framed as what should the UK do? It, taking for granted that we have a system of competing nation states, competing in an international order. And this is the, the basic framework. And so much of the discussion tends to be, how should we relate to the EU? How should we relate to the US? What's China gonna do? What's Russia gonna do? What should we do if they do this, if we do that? And that's obviously entirely valid, but I want to question, what happens if we look at the sort of world order as a structural system? Because I think there, if we do that, we see that there are some fundamental problems with that system. And that actually, whether it's China running the system or America running the system or Russia running the system, if the system is no good, it's a, a minor issue, right? So I wanna look at the nature of the system. Um, and I think that, you know, the fundamental, there's many things to say about it, but if we want to sort of boil it down to what's the fundamental problem, fundamental problem is that the economy and finance is global and yet politics and regulation and democracy is national and we have this fundamental mismatch and that unless we find a way to deal with that everything else sort of doesn't is unsolvable we, it's that's the reason that we can't solve climate change it's the reason we can't solve inequality it's the reason we can't solve so many of the problems the reason we can't deal with covid um, so how, you know, if we look at it and say, well, okay, so we have a global economy or a largely global economy and financial system, and it's basically impossible for separate countries to regulate that, right, or to tax these companies. And this means that the whole economic sphere or large parts of the economic sphere are essentially escaping government, escaping regulation, escaping democracy. So our whole democracy is, is getting eroded. And that's happening in different ways, but in virtually every country, all right? which I would include the UK in that, but it's not a problem unique to the UK. It's part of the structural system, the structure of the global system. So it also means that if we understand that basic point, talking about what is the vision of the kind of UK we want to, want to create, we have to look at the global situation too, because the global situation limits our choices, right? There are huge limits on our policy choices because of the fact that we have global capital, right? At the, at the, to, to give just a very clear example, we can try and increase corporate rates of corporate taxation, but corporations can just resettle somewhere else to somewhere in a lower tax jurisdiction. So we're not really free to do that policy. Um, so, if we want to be free to do these policies, we need to look at the global as well as the local altogether. Um, and if we understand that this is the fundamental problem, I mean, I, I was asked to come up with some practical things that we could discuss. So I'm gonna come up with a, a number of practical um, suggestions that the, the, the UK could indeed um, support. These won't get us to a final point of, of, of a better world order, but I mean, of, of a really good world order, but it really steps in that right direction. And I suppose I think the first thing is, is to actually have a vision. What world do we want, right? Not just what UK do we want, what world do we want? And this has to be, this is the, what, the new vision of the left, right? Because the reason that the left has lost a vision is because the vision of Bevin and all of the social Democrats after the, it's not possible in a world of global capital anymore. We cannot have, a UK that's completely social democratic and built in the way that the UK of the 50s and 60s was 
in a un world of unregulated global capital. So the new vision of the left has to be global, right? So I'm offering that as a, on, on the way to thinking, what is, what is the vision of the global left? So I think there are fundamentally four main things that we need to do. And I give some examples of, of, of sort of particular actions that would push in those directions. It's really just the tip of the iceberg. But the first thing is we need to find ways to reduce the power of global, global capital over nation states, right? And the examples I was giving about tax and, and, and so forth. Global capital has a huge power over the decisions that nation states and their governments make. Now, how Ultimately, we need, I believe, to have some kind of fully functioning global level system of, of regulation of, of, of finance, of capital, of business, right? That's, that's a big goal. That's not for the next few years. But how do we start moving in that direction? And there are a number of ideas that actually are floating around and are actually being discussed in various multilateral fora. But up to recently, the UK has not been very um, supportive of them <laughs> under the current government. And it's something that under a progressive Labour government perhaps could push in different directions. So the first thing I would uh, suggest is actually a global financial transaction tax, a global Tobin tax. Now this of course has been discussed in many countries and has been discussed at the G20 in uh, 2011. Um, France was very supportive of it. The UK was against it, along with the US and others. Um, and the, but a, a global currency transaction tax or financial transaction tax, as, as Tobin originally said, is a way of throwing sands in the wheel of, wheels of currency speculation. It's, it's weakening and loosening and slowing down this uncontrolled global finance that we have. And this is something that there's been a huge amount of policy work on how to do it. Like there's expertise and ideas out there but the UK is not supporting it. A progressive UK could support that and could become an advocate for that and really push that through. It would make a huge difference. Another way of reducing the power of global capital over nation states that would particularly um, be beneficial to the countries of the global south. And I think that if we want to talk about a progressive internationalism, it's not just what's best for UK, it's what's best for everyone. And how do we think about a more balanced system between the richer and the poorer countries? And um, as we know, most of the, of the countries of the Global South are in a terrible situation of sovereign debt. Um, and this situation of sovereign debt means that their policies are largely um, devised by the IMF, the World Bank and global creditors. Okay, it's a well-known problem. And there have been a suggestion that what we need to have at the, at, the, at the global level, possibly at the UN, is a sovereign debt tribunal some kind of global system of debt restructuring, debt negotiation, in certain cases, even ways of declaring bankruptcy and wiping debt clean, that would give um, a number of developing countries or global South countries, the ability to turn over a fresh leaf and, and start again and, and have a, ch a chance to develop and function. Um, again, this is actually being discussed at the UN. There's an ad hoc, um, um, discussion going on at the moment. The UK and indeed most of the rich countries are not supportive of this. If the UK were to take a different line and actually to mobilize other global north countries, it could make a huge, huge difference. Another thing, <coughs> excuse me, mm. is finding ways to reduce the power of transnational corporations, which again have just broken through the regulation of nation states um, and, and are increasingly getting involved in global governance and making decisions that affect everybody. Now, there, is, there are a number of things that we can do. First of all, there's the question that transnational corporations are virtually impossible to tax in our current system because we treat them as a network of separate, com separate companies based in different countries, but actually they are, of course, one kind of behemoth global um, corporation. So there needs to be some way of taxing them as that, and no single country on their own can do that. So how about we just we think about a, a global tax body, possibly at the UN, possibly somewhere else, where all the countries would democratically come around the table, think about how do we create a global tax system that's fit for the 21st century, because our tax system was, was created in the 1920s for a completely different world. And of course, if we can tax, tax um, multinational companies, then there's 
an influx of private money of money from corporations to states because governments are completely losing all their tax income at the moment, which means that they have no money to provide public services and so on. So everything is connected. Um, so I can say more about that, but that tax is a very important one. But another thing, for example, would be one, one current attempt to try and, in a very minimal way, regulate businesses is a process ongoing at the United Nations Human Rights Council to create a treaty on business and human rights, basically to make transnational corporations respect human rights in their supply chains and in their operations all over the world. Um, and this has been going on for the discussions for five, six years. They're actually start there. This, this year's session is next week. Um, you're smiling, Lisa, I see you're aware of that. But the UK has not been supportive of this. I mean, up till now, the UK has been negotiating you know, within the, the EU, but now that uh, the UK is out of the EU, it has an, op an opportunity to have a voice. Um, under the current government, it's highly unlikely to be supportive, but under a Labour government, taking a progressive vision to really support this treaty that would, you know, it's a very minimal thing to make sure businesses support human rights and respect human rights. Um, this would be a, a very good policy, um, practical thing that a, that a progressive um, Labour government could do. Um, the second thing, that was all un under the general heading of how we reduce the, the power of global capital over if states. We could, if we could move on a bit faster, Dina, is that okay? Because I've got two. Okay, I will zip through the last two very quickly. Sorry about that. I get carried away in these things. Um, we need to find ways to reduce the power of rich states over international organizations and to balance the relations between the North and the South. So, one of the things we need to do is to cre create an independent budget for the UN. Right at the moment, as, as you well know, the UN is financed by different countries according to their ability to pay, with the US paying the biggest chunk and then not paying it, and then crippling the, the UN's ability to do anything. So, for example, if we took the financial transaction tax, right, and we took a, 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 por a portion of the money that would be raised from that and gave that as a budget to the UN, right, this could. Um, allow the UN to be more independent and more neutral and not under the fingertips of the US or China or whoever the next hegemon is going to be, right? We need to bear that in mind. And we need to democratize the other international organizations, the World Bank, the IMF, um, the voting systems are, are all over the place, which basically allow them to uh, basically make them pawns of, of the US. A third thing we need to do fundamentally is increase citizen involvement in international politics and really democratize the global level. We need to bring decision, have citizens involved in decision-making. And there are a number of practical suggestions on this front. One is to set up a parliamentary assembly at the United Nations, which on a first, um, at the beginning would include parliamentarians in UN discussions, which would allow more progressive voices and alternative voices in there. And that ultimately could evolve to a system where citizens of the world directly elect and vote for their representatives. I think this would be a way of really connecting the global right down to the global. Another, another formula, um, possible idea here would be creating a world citizens initiative at the UN. So very much modeled on the European citizens initiative that would allow a certain number of, peop of, of, of people of the world who wanna put something on the agenda to be discussed at the UN General Assembly, that if they get enough signatures, that can happen the same as, as the European Citizens Initiative to bring a form of a direct democracy into the global system and into the UN. And fourthly and finally, to make all of this, of this happen and to make it work, there needs to be an effort put into building public awareness and support for a much more internationalized and globalized world. To let people understand like so much of our education system and our curriculums in high schools are written, <laughs> written first, right? And our, our history, but our history is, I mean, particularly us as, as the UK, as the leading colonizer of, of the last uh, few hundred years is intimately global. And many of the problems of the current day are largely, well, let's just say we played a, a, a big role in them. And so, Letting our children and our youth understand this as they grow up and understand the connections, I think is fundamental. Changing the media coverage so that people hear more about what's going on in other parts of the world, that what's going on at the UN, 
who has any idea who our ambassador to the UN is or what's being discussed at the UN or at the IMF or at the World Bank next week, last month. It's not part of the public discourse. Um, our news doesn't cover these things. So this is really to build awareness of the nature of the world, to actually change the nature of the discussion from what do I want of the UK to what I want of the world, because they're intimately connected. Because if we don't change the nature of the world, we will not be able to have the UK that we want. We will have a corporate controlled authoritarian um, you know, and, um, system. The, the COVID and all the tracking apps and all the rest of it is just pushing us further into that direction. So unless we really do something about it, we're going to we're going to lose even the UK that we have now. Brilliant, Dina. And we did ask how and you gave us lots of how. And that was the best bit of lobbying of a politician I've ever seen in my life in terms of getting the, uh, the your ideas on Lisa's agenda. So so well, well, well done for that. And look, this has always been the sort of dark cloud over our head, really, as, as progressives of how do you do how do you do the kind of linking of, of power? Uh, 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 and politics. How do you how do you you know end that decoupling and rejoin them? And you're giving us some of the steps towards that, which is just fantastic. And the bit that's been missing, I think, is not the is not necessarily the institutions. It's the public realm. It's the global agora in which people can have conversations, a demos within which people can talk and think and act. And that's what technology is doing. And that's what Anthony's essay tells us. It both kind of you know globalization drives those corporations, but it also drives the sense of global citizenship. And that's the terrain, that's the soil in which we can begin to develop the kind of institutions and infrastructure which you're talking about, um, because it gives it the kind of, you know, that democratic uh, space in which to, to operate. So that was fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, we'll, we'll, let's go over to Grace and get some questions from the people in the audience now. Um, uh, and we'll, see, we'll get as many in before before we finish at 7.15. And there's been a few in there and lots of comments. So Grace, do you want to pick some people out or ask some questions on their behalf? Thank you. Sure, yeah. I've got three people. So in this order, we're going to hear from Matthew Hulbert, then Christos, then Lorena Pilgrim. So Matthew, I'm going to unmute you if you want to go first. Hi, yeah. Um, so thanks, really interesting. Um, talk folks uh, my question was tony blair used to say when he was prime minister that the 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 main conflict that we had was not left versus right so much as open versus closed um and some of what i'm hearing tonight especially from lisa nandy seems to concur with that i'm wondering if you think it's more true now that it's open versus closed than it was even back then 10 plus years ago thanks Thanks, Matthew. Uh, next up, Christos, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to speak. Thank you very much and brilliant conversation. I was just referring to what Anthony said about the binary choice between the uh, European Union or the United States. And I think that's kind of a superficial question and Brexit is the superficial answer to it. And my question is, if uh, foreign policy based on values wouldn't be a more substantial answer to these rather old fashioned realpolitik questions. Um, the U UK could, uh, from my point of view, become a champion of environmentalism, as Lisa said, human rights, as well as functioning institutions to underline that. And if you have a public consent to that, that would be a real um, progressive foreign policy and you didn't uh, need to choose between the US or the European Union. Thanks. Thanks, Christos. Okay, uh, Lorena, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question. Um, but if not, I can read it out loud. Um, okay, yeah, I'll read it out loud because we've not got much time. So Lorena said, are there not lessons to learn from, for example, Taiwan? There, there, the explosion of enthusiastic activism from ordinary citizens following the Sunflower Revolution is delivering deliberative democracy, which is helping us, uh, helping to address what people saw as worsening economic inequality, opaque, unjust and unaccountable governing institutions and procedures and a growing but threatened sense of identity. Which way do you want to, do you want to tell, who, who do you want to go first, Grace? Um, is anybody raring to jump on any of those? Anthony is waving his hand. Do you want to go, go for uh, Anthony? As Christos put this point um, very bluntly to me, I wasn't saying that the old fashioned realpolitik was, should be foreign policy. I'm saying that 
there's certain unavoidable realities that a country the size of the UK faces. And it's not a matter of saying, do we support Europe or the United States, but that there are, there are basically going to be three areas of regulated internal regulation. They're not just one at the moment, but let's go for a global one if we can, as Dean has argued, but at the moment. And one is the European Union with a whole set of values about regulation. Another is the United States with a whole set of deregulated values. And another is China. And what the Chinese are saying is you have to make a call between one of these as a base point from which you can then make larger global value-based foreign policies. And one of the problems we have in, in, in the UK is an attempt simply to flee reality. So if I would push back by saying the point about Brexit is, it's a bit like saying we can have a values foreign policy and forget about the rest of the world. And I think that we need to be able to say, yes, we're, we're not for a chlorinated chicken, if I can use that as a symbol of being part of the American regulated space. So foreign policy is also, it, it, it now, because of regulation, it's now deeply matters to our daily lives, who, how, how our own government is run. And we have to position ourselves within a value system, either the one of our continent, Europe, which I would prefer, or we could try to join that of the United States. But I don't think we could just say, oh, well, we don't need to bother about that. Let's talk about the environment as everything, as if these, these pressing issues won't be there. And if I could just push back on Dina's wonderful, uh, uh, everything you, you were uh, advocating about the shift of power in terms of Tobin tax and so on is fine. But there's a problem here, which is um, that, that capitalism has always been bigger than our nation states. Okay, it's much bigger now in terms of corporate power, but it's always been bigger. The uneven development of capitalism has always put nations against nations. And we can't, I think, to ask our public and to ask voters to only think in global terms is a kind of impossibility. Therefore, there has to be an articulation between who we are as a country as a, a, which is our existing democracy and how we relate this democracy to other larger democratic issues. And I don't think we can escape that. So wonderful though that program is, the problem Lisa's got is to connect that, to connect the two between she's got to appeal to British voters or she will never be in, in office to conduct this policy with these larger global issues. You're on mute, Neil. Yeah, I know, I know. I got there. Dino, do you want to come back? Yeah, well, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll come back. I mean, I don't think I would say that I'm trying to get everyone to only think global, but I think at the moment, basically, people are only thinking national, right? Yeah. And so I want, I want to sort of even that out a little bit. Right. Um, and I think that we need to understand a little bit about what's going on globally in order even if we want to just change things in our in the UK, we need right. to, we need to actually we, we are part of a system. We can't sort of pretend. I mean, this question about open, closed, and left and right, like we're not closed off and not part of a global system. Like if we wanted to do that, we could put in capital controls. We could stop finance flowing everywhere. We could you know secure our borders 100%. And that's not on the agenda, right? No one, even all this nationalist rhetoric, isn't is not talking about doing anything like that. So we're part of a global system, but the way that the global system is set up now, it really limits the decisions that we can do because you know, we can come along and say, right, let's raise taxes, let's fund the NHS, let's um, make university education um, free and available to everyone from every background, all the things that I grew up with that were just there, okay? That today sound like, well, that's impossible. We can't, we can't do that. That, that. That's the answer that happens. And then you have to think, well, what, what's different? Why in the 70s was that actually just normal <laughs> and, and just uh, obvious and natural? And now it's this crazy impossibility. And that even if we had a progressive Labour government, like if tomorrow we had a progressive Labour government, it would still be incredibly difficult. They might be able to push a little bit back in that direction. But, this, but because of the system, the, the, of lowering tax income and rising inequality and all the rest of the things that I was talking about, 
they can't. <laughs> With the best will in the world, I don't believe that they, they could, they would be able to do that. And therefore, you know, working out how do we tax Facebook and how do we tax Google and how do we tax all the other billionaires, right, who operate in our country but don't pay any tax because they're registered in the Cayman Islands or somewhere to get that money back into so that we can provide public services. So it, it's all connected. And I think what I'm proposing is really that people understand that connection. Because if, if you think about the, the protest movements, just perhaps linking onto the question from um, Lorena, who was sort of saying, look at this amazing activism that was in Taiwan with the Sunflower Revolution, and that's led to more deliberative democracy and, and progress, right? But what, if we look at the activism, and there's been no shortage of activism in the West, so in the early 2000s or the late 90s, early 2000s, we had the so-called global justice movement or anti-globalization movement or anti-corporate globalization movement, which was indeed very much aware of, um, of, of the power of these international organizations of the World Trade Organization and, try, and trying to bring protest up to that level. And it didn't really get anywhere. And then you look at the next wave of protests, which I would say is the kind of Occupy Wall Street, Occupy London movement of 2011, which was a partly in response to the financial crash and austerity and so forth. And here the movements were completely nationally orientated, right? What was happening in, in, in the UK was different from, well, not different. These things were connected and reverberating off each other, put it that way but each movement was looking to its own national government to find a solution, right? So the, the protests in, in, in the UK were trying to call the UK government to do something. The protests in Israel were looking for the Israeli government to do something. The protests in Italy were looking for the Italian government to do something. And there was this lack of awareness of the, the problems of the global system. And this is a challenge because, because we don't have proper representative political institutions at the global level, or at least at the supranational level, there's sort of nowhere to protest, <laughs> right? They're protesting it against the WTO, but then you go, well, who, what is the WTO? Oh, it's all the representatives from the different countries. And then you go back down to the, to the national level. If we actually had something at the global level, there would be a place for protest, but I, I'll stop now, but uh, I do have things to say on that. Okay. Lisa, do you want to come in? I, 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 yeah. We're going to come back on any of those three. I'll just try and do a couple of quick things. Um, just on Matthew's question about left and right versus open and closed. I guess I, I tend to think about this as sort of both because I tend to think that the more open a system is, the more likely you are to get a settlement that works for everybody. In short, to get social justice, which somebody posted in the chat box was a, a value that they were slightly worried that I'd missed. But let me reassure you, that is absolutely at the heart of my approach to politics. And I, I just tend to think that the, you know, the way that Zoe Williams once put it at a Compass event I was at was that, you know, systems that are more porous, that are more open to challenge and willing and able to change, more inclusive, tend to produce outcomes that are better for most people and therefore much more sustainable when people feel a sense of ownership in something it tends to last in a way that it doesn't if you if they don't so you know that it felt to me when we had the very traumatic experience of you know I was a remain campaigner in a in a town my my hometown where most people felt very very strongly that they wanted to leave the European Union despite us holding similar political values and a sort of shared understanding of of the way that we want the world to be and that was you know, it felt to me that that was a lot to do with people feeling just no ownership or no stake in the European Union which you know I think all progressive politicians have to search our souls about why we haven't managed to to make that happen. Christos on your point about the US versus Europe I think it's increasingly becoming a sort of sim simplistic dichotomy but my bigger worry is that the UK has traditionally exerted influence in the world through three different spheres the Commonwealth the relationship with the United States and the role that we've played in Europe and what is starting to look increasingly likely is that for ver various reasons we have very little influence in, in any so there is a potential identity crisis looming 
we've left the European Union, but as we leave the transition period, global Britain is starting to look more like a slogan than a strategy. And with the challenges that I started this session by outlining, I think that is a real problem, not just for Britain, but for the world as well. There's a very good select committee report out today uh, by Tom Tugendhat, who chairs the Foreign Affairs Committee, which lays bare the, the extent of despair around the world about the way in which Britain has retreated from the world stage at exactly the moment when countries like ours need to stand, step forwards and come together. Um, I guess uh, just also to say, there, there was a bit of chat in the chat box about where are the other political parties. We, we've planned this as the first in a series of seminars. And one of the ideas that we had, I don't know if you've invited her yet, Neil, or whether I'm supposed to, which I'm happy to do, but we, we wanted to do a, a sort of in conversation piece with Leila Moran, who's just been appointed the foreign spokesperson for the Liberal Democrats as well. It's part of a an approach that seeks to draw on very different political traditions and Compass has traditionally been a good space as well to open up to political traditions that perhaps we don't consider as progressive in order to, to open up that space and, and the, the level of challenge to our politics as well. And then just finally, very quickly, I just wanted to say that I found that exchange between Anthony and Dina really fascinating. I mean, I, I do feel Anthony encapsulated the problem in a nutshell in that, you know, trying to articulate these big global sort of trends and systems in a way that makes sense to people um, and uh, locally is a, is a really big challenge. And equally trying to take what people are telling me at local level that they want the global system to, de system to deliver on and make that happen globally is, is a huge challenge as well. When Caroline Lucas and Chris Bowers and I wrote the book, The Alternative, we, we started nicknaming it the Wigan pub test because I kept saying, if I can't go and talk to people about this in a pub in Wigan, then we shouldn't be writing it in the book. And so it became the kind of Wigan pub test. And I just thought that that response from Dina was really fascinating about why people don't believe that these things are possible now. And I think it's because people have seen very clearly a global system that isn't isn't democratic democratized as, as Dina was saying in her opening contribution so you know when I have a constituent who can't get his flu drug prescription filled at his local pharmacy the problem it turns out is that there are only three companies licensed um, to distribute flu drugs in the UK and they're big global corporations one of whom owns boots so when there's a shortage of flu drugs I have to go to this big globe, Boots gets first dibs, my constituent, his local pharmacy can't get hold of them. And then that means that an 80 year old man is having to get two buses into town just to get his flu prescription. As a local MP, what do I do? Do I write to the, the shareholders, the directors of a global corporation based on the East Coast of the United States? There is a real problem of democracy here. And that's why people feel very, very strongly that the promises that we make at national level are just not possible. So I think it's, it's both. We've got to address both the global and the local. Did you want to come back quickly, Anthony? Yeah, so I, I do. It is a really, really important and interesting conversation, both what Dean has said and what Lisa's just said. And I take the thing about the flu drugs, absolutely a brilliant way of putting it. But I think where I don't agree with Dean is this, that I think that the shift from the protest movement being purely global and being pushed back and defeated to the protest movement of the Occupy movement becoming more national was a positive one. And I think what's happened now and the response to COVID, and this is the thing which I argue in this article, which um, Neil's very kindly referred to, is I think that there is an end of fatalism. And I think the sense of powerlessness that developed after the 1970s wasn't because, wasn't an objective consequence of the power of corporations. It was a, an ideology of the, the sort of, if you like, the neoliberal ideology saying, you know, I mean, Tony Blair stood up and told the Labour Party you could no more discuss globalization than whether autumn follows summer. I mean, the fatalism, we were, people were told and they understood the market rules, that's the way it has to be. So this powerlessness was an ideology. And I think that now, partly because of COVID, people have said, well, you know, we've got to, we, we, we're empowered, we've got to have it. And this sense, if you will have that feeling, well, what's the first people you turn to? You turn to Lisa, you turn to your government, and you say, well, what are you going to do about this? And then if Lisa wants to do something about the American corporation, well, I'm afraid, you know, I and mean, the best thing way of doing it is to make sure that the European Union 
has got his hands on proper drugs production. And the European Union is big enough, it's taking on Google, it's taking on Facebook, and the UK government has been suborned. The UK government has sold off these companies. The way Boots are sold off to private investors was absolutely outrageous. And, and uh, uh, so, so I think that the sense of the, the movement, the under 30s, this process movement, trying to get to grips the new politics with our own governments is the first step to our being able to make any impression on the larger world. And then just to get back to this Christos place, I say you said thank you and try. I don't know how you managed to read the chat at the same time as the screen, but I, my eyesight isn't up to it. Um, th this, this, the, you know, we, we have to do this within the existing global order if we're going to change it. Uh, but I, I do want to end this point. F the sense of fatalism about the way the world is run and about the way our governments are run and the way our governments affect the way the world is gone, that is over. That's a very big breakthrough. And this conversation is reflecting that. Right. I think I think what we'll do, we'll we'll leave it there, if that's okay, on that point of optimism. Unless unless Dina or Lisa want to come back with anything final, anything in particular? Definitely not. I want I want I want the optimism to prevail. So if Dina's got an optimistic comment. Yeah, she will do, I'm sure. Go on, Dina. If you've got a last word from you. Yeah, I just I'll be very quick. But I, I think I think the world really is at a tipping point now, and we have a time to really open up and look at different ideas, and I totally agree on that. I think it's dangerous as well as hopeful, right? I think we can also go in a very dangerous way and I'm not gonna end here, but <laughs> you know, at the moment with the NHS sending, selling all our uh, health data to multinational corporations like Palantir and Google and so on, we could be heading to a very authoritarian form of globalization way worse than anything we've had up till now, right? But on the other hand, if we vote in people like Lisa and other progressive politicians, into a country which hasn't entirely shot itself in the foot completely yet and does have influence on the international sphere, right? That we have an opportunity to steer things in a different direction. And it's not about either global or local, right? Like the, the NHS health app, this and whatever this is, is it local, is it global? It's both, right? It's, it's we can't separate these things out. But as with Lisa's uh, um, example about the flu jabs, Many local problems can only be solved when you dig down at some multilateral global level. Now, that doesn't mean ignoring what's happening at the local at all, but it means understanding the inter interconnections and, you know, focusing action where, where you can change things. So I would hope very much that we could have a progressive, um, a progressive political movement that is both global and local um, and left and green, um, and that we can open to talk about all sorts of things. Like, let's put ideas out there. What about if we had a global welfare state? Crazy idea. But this is the time to put the crazy ideas on the table, I believe, and open, blow open everybody's minds and then see where we get to, right? So that would be my, my, my finishing remark. Let, let's really blow things open. Yeah, and which is what, um, uh, which is what, uh, the left and progressives did after 1945, um, uh, but we did it because there was, you know, ideas brewing, networks were made, connections were, were made, and we used the moment really effectively, and we can use this moment really effectively, and it is and will be contested, but there is an optimism that wasn't there in the 80s and 90s, that because citizens are now connected, uh, talking, can organise, can know what's going on in every corner of the globe, this does begin to change everything. So we don't have to, you know, ride the corporate tiger the, of globalization like New Labour did and hope to humanize bits of it. It isn't just a question of putting up the barriers and protectionism or letting rip like Singapore. There is a new kind of possibility on the horizon if we get the politics of that right. So in this process, in, in this series, um, around Build Back Better. We're going to be looking at more domestic things in the, in the next week or so, but we'll come back to this conversation with Lisa and hopefully bring Anthony and Dina back in at a later stage and, and that how we began to think through um, in a more consistent, coherent uh, way um, some, of the, some of the elements of, of, of that. Um, the next Build Back Better House session will be on Tuesday at six o'clock. This is for Compass members only. 
uh, event. It's looking at UBI, Universal Basic Services, a four-day week and sovereign money. So if you want to come along to that um, uh, and are not yet a Compass member, then please join us. There are further events open to everyone on Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday lunchtime and Saturday afternoon. So please uh, come along to all of those. Um, finally, just like to say, thank you, all of you for being part of this conversation tonight. Very really much. like to thank Dina, Anthony and Lisa and Grace for your help. Um, let's keep our fingers crossed for November the 3rd and we get a good result there. At least then we've got the chance of opening up more debate. But this is a big issue. We cannot duck it. We're going to have to keep coming back to it because as Dina says, we're not going to be able to do the things we want unless we put in place the right kind of structures and the right kind of democratic framework. So I look forward to developing that conversation. Brilliant stuff. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.